of the manufacturing group. And we got today here Earl and uh, Fan. Um, so I'll just hand it over to Earl and please start with your introduction and Fan's introduction and we can get started. Awesome. Thank you everybody for the opportunity to speak to you about what we love and that's intelligent automation. My name is Earl Peck. I have a, uh, a varied career in consulting as well as uh, a full-time employment as a C-level officer and senior executive. I've been in the industries of telecommunications, retail, supply chain, government, a um, couple of others I can't remember, uh, hospitality, as well as some manufacturing companies as well. And right now I'm the owner or co-owner of Arjun Business Group, and we focus primarily on intelligent automation and CRM consultation. Bon, would you like to take over, please? Yeah. So, <laughs> hi guys, uh, name is Fan Raharjo. I've been in IT consulting realm mostly almost 20 years and been playing or been implementing different solutions for different industries. And also like I'm a co-owner uh, co of Arjun Business Group. Nice meeting you guys. Uh, if you could pull up the presentation, please. Yep. Let's get the show on the road. Dum, dum, dum. Let's make sure that, can you guys see my, my screen? Can everybody see it? Yes. yes. Did I hear the right one? This one, right? With my cursor? Yep. You got it. Excellent. Excellent. You'll see under that we're an authorized UI at Path partner. So this is part of my disclaimer. Uh, we work with all different RPA automation software companies. Right now, we're a solid partner with UiPath. And I'm not going to try to sell you anything. Our intent is not to sell you any software product or services, but to inform and educate you on RPA slash intelligent automation. And let's get going with that. On, just pull up the next slide. Um, okay. Give me a sec. I guess I could share, but I think my screen froze. Well, that's not good. Give well, Fonz, let me re -share. You got it? Uh, let me re share. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, take two. All right, got it? Okay. So before going to the agenda, I wanna just let you know that we tailor our solutions to your you know, the business needs and the business focus. And we don't believe in any single tool. We believe there's no solid one solution in automation and that uh, you come up with many different solutions and we'll talk about different ways and different solutions that you can do that. Our approach primarily is taking a practical return on investment approach to intelligent automation using a capacity model for all of our clients. So we don't sell packages. We work very closely with our clients with their existing return on investment um, protocols and try to provide business value immediately out of the gate, okay? We're also gonna highlight relatable and real life actual case studies and provide you information to utilize in each of your automation journeys. So um, there'll be a lot of content, a lot of material, but it's, it's built primarily for you to go back and reference and utilize at your beck and call and at your leisure, okay? So the journey is going to be taking you through what RPA is, what it is not, how we go about doing it with people. Um, and this has been time proven and very successful. Um, and, and the whole approach has been honed as a result of every success and has gotten better and better and better as we've gone through this. And we do focus on creating an automation candidate pipeline of value that justifies the expenditure and the investment in intelligent automation RPA, which then leads to uh, ML and AI. We will not be talking about AI, we will not be talking about ML, we'll be focusing on just this one area and focusing on it pretty heavily, okay? Ron, right, can you go ahead? So who we are and the value that we bring, we're a boutique consulting company focused on helping clients optimize and automate business processes and drive efficiencies and also increase their productivity. We're a very practical organization and we've found that the best success um, in intelligent automation and RPA is a bit different than how people traditionally interact with IT. I've been a CIO many, many times and my experience as a CIO, both uh, as CIO and on the business side is that the business comes to me with a problem. I come up with a tool and a solution and I make them happy by delivering a solution that works and solves their problem. 
our approach to intelligent automation in our pay is very different. We look at it as a program. You use automation every day in your life. You should be using automation every day in your workplace. It's amazing to us how many times we encounter resistance uh, from people to use automation in their work uh, space. And then when you talk to them about their personal space, they use it all the time without a second thought. And what we encounter often is that we impress upon anybody entering into the journey of intelligent automation that the business has the greater degree of responsibility, not IT. The business must understand and know their processes because those processes are what we're going to automate and will rely on, in large part, rely on the business knowledge that those participants, those subject matter experts, and those owners of those business processes have. And the way we want to have this presentation is very carefree and open, in which you guys can jump in and ask questions as we go through this. We won't hold off questions until the very end. We just like to have a very interactive uh, presentation because we know there's going to be ideas or thoughts you're going to have, and you want to bring those out. And we're more than open to go through that. Again, uh, as I, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, one question, sorry to stop you. Uh, what yeah. is the difference between intelligent automation and RPA? RPA is a fundamental piece of intelligent automation. We look at it as really the first step in intelligent automation, okay? If you, for instance, it's more like digitized workers, right? In which you're, you're, you're taking spreadsheets and you're taking the people work out of it, the human element, and then replacing it all with automation. We found that many people who jump into AI or ML are very ill-equipped and are very unsuccessful because they want to jump into something and they don't fully understand it. They don't have a really good goal or objective of what they're trying to accomplish. And what we do with Intelligent Automation RPA is we sit back and say, okay, what is the problem you're trying to solve, right? What do you want to achieve? What's your return on investment? Very commonsensical, but it's amazing how little common sense comes into play in this space whether it's AI or ML or, or RPA. Am I answering your question, Dinesh? Yeah, so you say RPA is kind of step one as part of the intelligent automation. Um, could be, right? Yeah. So can, can I have something to add? So intelligent automation is basically the umbrella. Mm -hmm. So the trend now is people talking about AI, right? In most cases, sometimes people come to us saying like, hey, we want to use AI. And we'll, we ask the question back, like, right? what are the use cases? How are you planning to use it, mm -hmm. right? So when we say RPA is fun, 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 fundamental, component is because RPA is very practical. It's a digital worker, basically. We identify what the business needs are, then we can tailor the solution. Mm -hmm. It could be part of the solution, could be RPA and AI or machine learning, or it could be end up with like, hey, you need a custom code and we built a code to interact with AI or gen AI, right? Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, as far as the solution, we always tailor the solution based on the business needs. At the end of the day, a tool is a tool, right? Okay, thank you. Yep. So then again, let me go back and talk about we deliver value added work driven by return on investment. Return on investment is the fundamental reason why you want to automate. Okay, what we encounter many times, especially in the manufacturing space recently, there is um, a drain on intellectual property or people leaving that space and there's no one to do the work that they, they've used to do and it's better to automate that than hire new personnel. Bond, you want to go on to the next slide, please? Yep. We have a motto of how to make the impossible possible, all right? And we focus on positive and practical answers. If it doesn't make sense, we're not going to do it, and we're going to tell you. There's many times people have wanted to do RPA, and they would not be successful if they, they, they tried it. And we've told them that, and we told them the reasons why. We told them it was better just to re-engineer your processes or do an API or some other technology solutions versus RPA, and RPA really wasn't the right fit in where they were going. And it constantly surprises people when we do that because they're expecting us to come to them and say, oh yeah, RPA does everything and this is, it solves all your problems. Uh, we don't take that approach. We ask, does it add value to your business operations? And that value is metric centric, everybody. It's not a subjective statement. We try to use the metrics that are by the organizations we work with and if they don't have them, we introduce metrics cost efficiencies, revenue gathering, operational inefficiencies corrected, all sorts of things like that. And then we look and ask them, like I said earlier in the presentation, what's the problem you're trying to solve? And sometimes what we found more often than not is the problem that someone's trying to solve really isn't the problem. It's just one of the symptoms of a problem. And then we drive down into that. 
and we get agreement on the problem and we move forward, okay? And then we always ask ourselves, are we implementing the right solution? And are we having people work smarter rather than harder, okay? If you, if you can't work smarter through automation, there's a real problem, okay? Go ahead, Fun. So this is our approaches and just as example, right? Automation strategy, automation operating model, implementation, flexible, and implement COE. And our approaches is basically, again, basically depending on the business needs and our uh, intelligent automation or automation journey or RPA journey, like Rob mentioned, created like a sub program, not a project. In most cases, when RPA or intelligent automation initiative failed is because they're trying to trade it like a project, not a program. And just to give you kind of like an illustration is think of like kind of like eating healthy, right? If you're eating healthy once in a while, sure, but that should be a lifestyle. And we, keep, we need to continue keeping that habit in order to, to, to maximize the benefits. Mm -hmm. And- sure. Good. Okay. Awesome. Based on based on this is basically like we're trying to facilitate anyone or any organization wherever they are in their journey at the beginning or in the middle of it or when they just need to scale up. So the approaches that have been built around proof of concepts or any type any place where you might be in your automation journey or often than not we've had many people who failed in which we've had to come in and do a rescue. Yep. Okay. Next. All right. So what is robotic process automation and what it is not? Bob, would you like to take this slide and talk about it a little uh, further? Yeah, yeah. So robot, robotic process automation is basically, if you think, if you will, call it like digital workers. It's basically like the, the environment where it shine is in today's technology, people are so used to being driven by our habits, basically being dictated by the application or the technology. But in today's realm, it's the other way around. Business is the driver because technology today can keep up, right? Even for example, where it's shine is integrations. In back, back in the day, if there is no API, we cannot integrate two applications. In today's realm, we could use RPA to integrate two applications using the user interface. Mm -hmm. So basically, like, if you will, like digital worker, it's just like a human doing it. So if you see a robot in action, it's basically like you're seeing someone doing it, but faster and more accurate. Mm -hmm. And again, one of the key benefits is robots never sleep and make zero errors. One of the common elements that people point out that we always have to correct is people have a tendency to say that in RPA, the robots work 24 seven. Um, that is not true. What we found is that the robots can work about an average of 17 hours a day. And that's because of when you're scheduling the robots to process work activities. Okay. So if you've ever heard someone say to you seven hours, you know, seven days a week, 24 hours a day, that is an incorrect assumption. They usually rest around 17 hours on an average a day. Okay. Next slide, please, Svan. So RPA is a renewed re uh, enterprise tool. Okay, it does require a minimal upfront investment, and that investment is really dictated by what, how you want to approach it. If you want to do a proof of concept, or you want to begin building a program, um, it also can realize a very quick benefit realization. And here's where most people have a problem with RPA and have difficulty. We're going to tell you the good stuff, and we're going to tell you the bad stuff. All right, because we want you to avoid the bad stuff. When people typically build bots, as you call them in RPA, they focus on sub processes or tasks. They don't focus on an entire process, an end-to-end -end process, and they don't do a value assessment, total value assessment on building that bot. You'll find many people will judge themselves by their success by how many bots they build, or again, how many work hours they've eliminated. But when you drill down on these kind of calculations, you'll find that the bots that people built are simple desktop bots or task bots that don't really add a lot of value uh, when you measure specifically against the return on investment, okay? Uh, they just don't really play up. And also, we've been called in many times to come in and do an analysis of someone's justification of how many hours they saved. And we found that that justification usually turns out to be only a small percentage of what was stated. Uh, and, and the question of the program is, the program is called into question at that point. There is no disruption to underlying systems when you implement RPA correctly. Okay, there's none whatsoever. 
So the traditional disruption that you see from implementing a new system or something like that is not really seen in this arena. And it's usually very easy to put into production. It does require a partnership between business and IT with business being more of the lead and IT being playing a guiding role and a gatekeeper role, okay? It's very, very scalable and it adjusts to a changing business environment, but you would never, if you were in a, if you were doing a massive rollout of a new application and had a lot of change going on, you would not do a RPA. You would wait for everything to get settled in that application and it would be working normally. And then you could go about and do an RPA implementation of some aspects of that later on, okay? So it says up top, it's high volume actions done automatically, very cost and time efficient, okay? Bon, please go ahead to the next slide. Let's get to the benefits in the pipeline. That's really where it's at. Um, if the benefits aren't there, you don't do it. You've got to build a quality pipeline. You've got to take the time to do it. What we've done here is we've broken out the time savings, cost savings, and growth, and broke them into certain uh, fields like customer experience and compliance for you, okay? Are there any that jump out? Do anybody has any questions on or anything? Are they pretty self-explanatory as you go through them? To reach these benefits, again, you must understand the processes that you're automating. And what we found time and time again, this is the longest pole in the tent. People believe they understand their processes, but you find as you're diving down the processes that much of the information has been handed down tribally over and over again to people. Training has been very minimal and people just learn as they're doing. Um, for example, we went into a healthcare company uh, and the healthcare uh, vice president said, I understand my processes. Um, there'd be no problem in, in automating. And what happened was when we went down into the healthcare company and we started going through the process, he understood only the very beginning of the process. And they were using what you would call 1099 personnel, temporary personnel. And every one of, without it, exception, every temporary person was doing the process differently. So there was, we had to rebuild that process. And it was good because when we rebuilt the process, we reduced and wiped out the need for all the temporary personnel. And they wound up using that process to help them in their integrations with other companies and their acquisitions. So you can use, one of the benefits that are on, on here, is you can use RPA as a strategic tool in targeting uh, companies that you want to acquire. And we can go into that in further detail if anybody has any questions. On to the next slide, please. Here's where we go into pipeline creation and assessment, okay? Again, you'll see a constant theme here in a stream of thought of creating value and continuous improvement, okay? When you're going down an automation journey, it just doesn't start and it keeps on going and you realize the benefits. Once you start going through RPA and you get very, very well versed in it, you'll start to explore other avenues of ML and AI in a combination of all of the above, okay? We always focus on key metrics. Is the process repeatable and is it predictable? Does it have a high volume? These are all qualifying items when you're looking at a process to automate, okay? Is the data structured and is it a standard data format? Is it complex? Does it require manual work and written text? And again, as I said earlier, you'll see here, here's the basic rule we follow when there's an environment that's very much changing. Is the process workflow expected to change in three to four, three to six months? The application is expected to change in three and six months. We do not want clients to waste money in building bots that are going to change with a system rollout. We do not believe in wasting people's time nor money. Okay, but we have used bots to accelerate system development and applications and integrations. And those are what we call temporary bots that would then use, fulfill their function, then be reacquired for another function within the organization. Okay. Um, yeah, something yeah. something to add is uh, this kind of like good to, to illustrate, like again, as to your original question about intelligent automation in RPA, for example, right? If you see the key metrics and process inputs and parameters, those are more like a black and white qualifiers. But if you see process complexities require interpreting handwritten text, for example, require manual work, that's where we start measuring the complexity and start thinking about the how. 
what else do we need as part of intelligent automation platform that can help um, optimizing your business process, right? This includes AI, machine learning, OCR, ICR, Gen AI, and other things. Next, next slide, please. This is where we talk about the specific journey, okay? Everybody goes through the journey, the intelligent automation journey. They either start with a proof of concept, which is prove, and then go on to establish a program or a series of automations they're going to do or scale and expand throughout the organization and continue improvement. We've had people jump in to establish. We've had people jump in to expand. We have people just go right into scale immediately. So we've come up with this simple diagram that demonstrates a progression that many people follow, but rest assured, people jump two, three, four, it's, it's wherever, okay? And the methodology that we follow in delivering value-driven uh, bots is it keeps this kind of in, in a, uh, a sane order, okay? On next one. So the journey phases, right? As you go through this, you prove and establish, expand and scale, you see different elements in here, okay? This is not meant to bore you to death. It's, it, you can refer to this later. It's just to show you the elements that go into the program, okay, as you go through this, all right? So if you took number one, proof, and you want to do a proof of concept, the proof of concept can go six, eight to 12 weeks, and it's very small, and you pick out a specific task that you want or a process that you want to automate. You develop a, a program sponsor, you secure proof of concept fund funding. And it's, it's not a large amount of funding. It depends on the complexity of the bot that you want to do as a proof of concept. And of course, that depends on the size of the company it will determine that, okay? It, the most important element is identifying the automation candidate. And what we do when we're doing a proof of concept, many people just do a proof of concept, a one-off. We go in and do a proof of concept and build an automation candidate pipeline. So we'll go in, like we're working with a international uh, tile company right now. And actually it's kind of funny, they wanted to do AI, but after talking to it, they decided to start on RPA first. And they want to look at all of their credit and collection processes as well as their purchase order processes. And we explained to them that we would sit down and build the pipeline and then choose a proof of concept out of the pipeline that we worked on together, okay? And then we do a communication plan. The communication plan will say, will tell exactly what we decided to do, okay? And it's used to educate everybody on what the return on investment is, the value of this, okay? The time set that we need to do it in or are going to do it in. And that's used to demonstrate communications to all across the organization from the C-level all the way down to the VP and the SME level who owns the business process itself. Okay, any questions? Next one, fine. And something to add and transition to the next slide. So Ms. Kolek has mentioned again, look at the intelligent automation initiative as a program, not a project. And to illustrate that, one of the things we show here is the process life cycle. Mm -hmm. And for anyone who's familiar with software development life cycle is basically like that. Yep. But this is a project, and right. as a program, we're going to have multiple projects, if you will. So each of idea for optimization and automation in the pipeline is going through this cycle. So discover for what it is and why it is, and then we do the design, the how, then we implement it. We deploy, I mean, obviously part of the implementation is testing. We deploy it, we deliver and then part of the calculation, if you see, are we always value driven and being practical? Uh, we do the estimated ROI upfront, if you see here during Discover. And then the right thing to do is once it's in production, you review the estimate and see how close it is and what is the actual ROI. Yep. Typically, what we've seen in investments, we've had in investments up for a million dollars. Someone got 12 million back, others got eight, some got six. We've had uh, client engagements of $2 million, $500,000 savings. 
and all the programs that we work in are continue to be in existence two to three years, three and a half, four years later. Okay. This process life cycle, it's not one of the things that um, I want you all to be very comfortable with is that it's not us coming in with a methodology or a way of doing business that will be like alien to organizations. What we do is we come in and work with the business side in IT to complement the processes and procedures that are already existing and then fit how we do business into how that company or that client does business. Because the true focus always has to be on building automations, value-driven automation, <clears throat> and delivering results and, 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 and payback for the effort that's been done. Okay? Next one, Bob. I have one question. Uh, uh, yes, sorry. go ahead, Ganesh. Now, uh, in your experience, what's an average uh, time period for the pay payback? You know, I know there's an investment upfront, right? Yeah. So what, what's an average payback period to recover the investment? So, Pan, do you want me to take that or do you? I'll go ahead. So it's kind of funny. Um, with the most recent client that we have, the uh, tile company, the uh, the controlling officer asked me that question. He said, okay, how long is it going to take you to do this? And I had told him, I'm not really a consultant, you know, so I'm a professional. So I might answer this question and surprise you. And they said, well, I really would be surprised if you answered it. I'm waiting. So they're already geared up for my response, right? And I said, well, 12 weeks. <laughs> and the control officer said, that's the first time in 20 years anybody ever answered that question, <laughs> right? And he and, and he later came out and said, you know, Earl, I, I understand the complexity thing and all this other stuff. And I was actually waiting for you to come up with all these consulting answers and you didn't. And I said, well, you know, it's all about the work we're gonna do together at the very beginning, Ganesh, defining the right one and, 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 and define the problem and what you want to accomplish, right? And getting that, that down. So when we sit there, we do an intake form in which we're really doing a quick analysis and a detailed analysis. You'd be surprised how detailed it is on that automation and everybody's learning quite a bit. So you got that excitement that everybody's like, holy cow, there's, there's really a lot going on here. And then at the very end of the process, when we deliver it, we do something that no one else does. And I didn't even do this when I was the CIO and I learned to do it is I went back and, and evaluated, do I, did I achieve what we said we were going to achieve as a return on investment? And you'd be surprised, about 75% of the times we're on track either delivering exactly what we had talked about with the business or above. And the other 25% is because it just is a learning, right? The things yeah. you don't know. So we drive for results as quickly as possible, okay. very, very quickly, okay? Yeah, and, that, yeah, yeah. One understanding uh, what I've seen is uh, especially when it comes to RPA, highly uh, manual task, right? Highly repetitive manual task. Those, yeah. those become the, like a uh, immediate targets for uh, auto, uh, candidates for RPA automation. Yes. Highly repetitive manual task. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Invoicing, purchase ordering, ordering, things like that are, are yeah. bank transactions. We'll go into a lot of, when we get to sure. case studies, we'll really have an active dialogue on that because you'll start to see a lot of what you know already coming into play. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Yeah, there's uh, some, some, something to add, Ganesh. That's uh, it's like repetitive tips and high volume and also rule base. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because that's the black and white piece, right? <laughs> if then else, but yeah. that's where the machine learning and AI components play to handle more of the gray area. If that makes sense. And for the ROI, I mentioned about 12, uh, 12 weeks. Let's use that as an example. But as far as ROI, that also depends on what's the purpose of doing this initiative? What is the goal and the objectives, right? Because there are some that we need to do this because there is no other option. Then whatever the value is, is there $50 amount? And also there's some for like a cost avoidance. In order for us to achieve the value, we need to double the team. Right. Right. And there was like actually like a one client that we did and part of the, the their challenge, their pain point is they keep training people because the, the, the work is so boring. People come on board, they spend a couple months to train them. These people say they're working there for three months, then they quit. So basically they spend one month, one to two months training and these people will stay for three months. Right. Like Ganesh at the tile company, um, they, they can't, the new people coming into positions in finance don't want to do the finance role. They can't keep anybody because all they're doing is spreadsheet financing. 
right? They're not really doing financing. They're just doing spreadsheet finance. So they're like, <laughs> we've, got to, we've got to automate all these. Two things that we didn't mention here is that, um, and we didn't know how deep you get into in the technology, but Ganesh, we focus on in, in, in unattended bots are the first bots we traditionally build with an organization, okay, versus the attended bots. There's many reasons for that. The unattended bots are more of workhorses for us and deliver an investment return much faster than attended bots. Attended bots will come into more play in customer service and more interaction and decision-making. So we will focus more on the unattended. The other aspect that you didn't hear us talk about, but you'll hear a lot of people talk about in RPA is the number of hours FTE saved. We do not, we do not focus on that whatsoever. Uh, and the reason for that is it's a short-term play and the results come out of the automation and you don't lead with, well, we're going to reduce as many people. As a matter of fact, all the automations that we've done, we've never reduced anybody. We've repurposed every person to do some other task that was not being done in the company. And when I've met with many officers of the company, I asked them, I always ask them this question one-on-one, uh, -on -one, and it makes it easy for me to be a past C-level officer. You can ask it in a way that's not threatening, is that what are you not doing today that you wish you could do if I start automating everything for you? And you'd be surprised, Ganesh, a lot of a lot of executive officers do not have an answer to that, which is very surprising um, because I find that many people now are defining themselves by the job they do. They're not defining the job and they're having a difficult time applying automation in, 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 in a very robust way throughout their organization. And many times they're just trying to keep their heads above water, you know, because they got balance of books, they got compliance, sustainability, and material and parts they've got to worry about tons of issues going on all over. Okay. So go to the next slide, please, Bob. Uh, before, uh, yeah. there's another question. I mean, uh, yeah, I was uh, questioning about the discovery phase, the first one. Uh, yep. So generally speaking, how you guys do go about it? Like, is there any tool you guys utilize, like a template, questionnaires? And also I do understand that it depends on the complexity of the processes that we are mm -hmm. trying to automate and, and the yep. scope of the work. But generally speaking, the discover phase, how long it takes? Two questions. Okay. Yep. okay, so actually you asked, you asked kind of four or five, and I'm going to answer all of them <laughs> on that. <laughs> So we have, you might have heard me earlier talk about the intake form. So a long time ago in my career as a CIO, I learned that one of the most valuable people in the organization was a business analyst, okay? And I really strive to get the best people who could talk technology and business and business technology. And my life got considerably easier and we delivered a whole lot more. So when we built the input form or intake form, it was built to do discovery knowing that I might not be able to, the time, people's time are valuable, right? I have a lot of people to talk to and I only have a limited time to talk to people. So we go in with an intake uh, document that's, I think it's now two pages of questions, right? It's very non-intrusive, but it, it's built to get as much information in a short amount of time as possible. We'll do recordings of the processes as well, okay? And then that intake form, we'll take that form and we'll look at that and then we'll start to build what you would call the uh, requirements document, okay? So it's a, a stepping stone. So the intake document goes into the requirements document and then it goes into the technical document. So it's just, we keep building as we go along. And the discovery process, we've had them take what fun, three weeks, four weeks, Two weeks, they're all over the board. It depends on the complexity, obviously, but um, that is probably the most important section of the process. I'm, I'm kind of biased because I did. I learned a long time ago when I was working uh, for my Baldrige Ward uh, application that the best process was the one you spent the time defining the most at the very beginning and getting it nailed down, and it made the the workflow, the production flow, you know, work much more successfully. So we spend a lot of time on discovery and interviewing people. Am I answering your questions, your four questions? Yes, it, it did. And I, I guess the way, uh, like a couple of information I got it from the UI path. So I, is your process inspired by the UI path the structure? Actually, it's funny you say that. I'm kind of proud of this is that we've been doing automation. I've been doing this since 2010. Um, I used to be a Blue Prism partner in 2015 when at their height of their, their abilities. 
And I was interviewed by UiPath uh, for the way that we do business while they were building their platforms and their business processes. So we worked very closely with them. And we've also been consultants on some of their projects for them as well. So the process lifecycle you see in front of you is more of a development out of our experience of the, doing IT, traditional IT I'm in, okay, and applying mm -hmm. that to RPA, right? I've, I've often built software factories wherever I've gone, whether I was on the business side or the IT side, in which the focus was building a pipeline, delineating between maintenance and, and enhancements and new features and development, and then just driving that and time boxing each of these items. So I time box discovery, design, development, deployment, and delivery, and just drive it like a factory to where you know you got your raw material and I got my finished product. Does that give you more enlightenment in how we approach it? Yeah, I, I actually like it. Your your approach is pretty more practical than theoretical. So so thank you so much for explaining. And, and then oh. we only we only have three artifacts too. By the way, we don't have a lot of artifacts. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks. Actually, it, it's funny. I mean, I do have a question for you. Yes. And that's actually like nice because you're very familiar with UiPath realm, right? We did explain a lot and we answer your questions. But when you say discover, you're falling into the project program trap because this discover, if you see it's a process life cycle, mm -hmm. this is for individual process. But there is also part of the journey proof. That's the first step into intelligent automation as a program. Yep. So, so those are two different things. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Bon, bon, I mean, Bon brought up something too that just triggered my memory, and I, I just want to bring this out to you. Um, it's a very key thing too. It, 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 we it, we qualify the automations at the very beginning, and if they're not valuable, we don't do them unless the client wants to do it for you know PR or to demonstrate something quick to everybody. So we vet out the stuff that doesn't work. We don't get sidetracked by a, a lot of noise and activity. You follow what I'm saying, sir? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. It's about finding the automations that make sense and give value as quickly as possible and focusing all the work on that and delivering it, which enables us to come back with a much shorter time frame of delivery than normal, okay? And generally speaking, who is the sponsor from the company? So is it the business analysis side, uh, the people in the finance department? It's interesting. It's interesting. It, it, I'm, I'm on it. There's like, it changes. It really does change. The sponsors historically are on the business side because there's pain points they can't get addressed because IT is working on other elements and in, in, in places. I've had situations where IT's been the sponsor uh, and didn't really understand, know what to do with RPA because it doesn't fit the mindset of how they operate, right? And they were the, the drivers of it and then just turned it over to the business. And it's kind of funny because when I started in business you know, a long time ago in the 80s, I never got any IT resources to do any of my jobs that I had to do. It all went to you know, customer service, marketing, or, or operations, right? And I had to learn to do what you would call then, you know, guerrilla IT or gray market IT, right? develop my own resources. And what I did a long time ago is I sat down with IT where, wherever I was and said, what are the rules in which you allow me to develop? I'll abide by your rules, run everything through testing, and I'll do those things you can't do. So very early in my career, I learned that behavior and applied that to RPA. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yep. And it worked. It works every time. <laughs> why change what it, you know? Why change it if it works? But so I was very grateful yeah, for that experience. I agree. Me. Does that I answer agree. your questions? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Okay, cool. And I'm hoping Fonz kept track where we're at now. The manufacturing use cases. Okay, so we gathered together some key use cases for you around product productivity, revenue growth, customer experience, compliance, and sustainability. Okay. And we're going to have, there's a lot of text on those and you can read those at your leisure, but we just want to go over and give you a taste and a feel for what other people have done. Okay. And you'll see right here, they're broken out. Here's the ones that we find are the most common. Okay. Now, there are some that jump out on the finance side, like we're really getting asked again and again and again to do accrual processing. And we're also seeing an increase in compliance requests. Another thing that we're seeing increase in 
is that um, for companies that are international in nature, that um, I'll use a tile company as an example, because they, they seem to capture everything that we've encountered in one place, is that they're dealing specifically with a lot of European operations that are very small in nature in which they get quality uh, tiles and different tiles. So we see a lot of supply chain requests coming in to automate what is very homegrown, manual, and um, very personality-driven processes and trying to get those into a more generic, uniform-driven process with metrics on that. Okay, and then do you have a question? No, I don't, I'm good, thanks. Okay. So, um, and again, uh, what we are seeing is a, 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 a resurgence in finance requesting a lot of uh, RPA activities, which we haven't seen before. And then there's also a resurgence in the purchasing uh, sector as well, okay? So this will leave us. Um, one, one thing to add: the same approach, the same concept, it applies to different industries and different departments within the organization. Right, right. And then uh, we have a, a healthcare company that's also applying AI and RPA simultaneously to their customer service group. Okay. So you can read the text where it says sourcing and purchasing. You see the metric over to the right side, but start here is what's really important. You'll see again, certain things come out, data entry and processing, supplier onboarding and vendor management. That is a huge area, a huge area of opportunity and one that we've been very successful in. Um, it's kind of scary on how poorly um, that area is managed, monitored, and, and, and how the processes are more antiquated and are done more tribally based on individual's perspective uh, rather than a um, formal perspective by a, a, an organization. One of the things that are key deliverables that comes out of the RPA experience that I didn't mention is that, um, and I actually two clients of ours in manufacturing asked this, is that why well, get written processes and workflows? And when we said yes, uh, men, they were more excited about getting those processes documented in the workflows I, I, than, than they were about doing the bot right away. They're like, holy cow, this is great. We never had any of our processes mapped and we don't know our workflows. This is going to be fantastic. So it's really kind of a, a, a benefit that just comes out of the process, out of that discovery. Okay. The next one will be supply chain management, inventory turnover, and order fulfillment. Order fulfillment perhaps is the largest that we encounter. And it's one that has many times the least control and understanding by the organization. And that's just the reason why they want to automate it. And they also have a dependency on intellectual property where people are just leaving and changing out. We also find again, that there's many people who come into positions and, and don't want to do the level of activity of order fulfillment that's there today. And that's driven automation. The next one, please. Production and maintenance. And then that, I think this is the last one, right, Fun. The next one. Marketing and sales. Marketing and sales. It's, uh, do you want to talk about this when you want me to, Fun? Yeah, I can, I can provide like one, one of the things we do is actually using like a real scenario that we'll face. There's like a manufacturing retail uh, web scraping, basically because one of the processes, it was done manually before, where they do have resources that goes around visiting websites, checking out prices, just making sure that their pricings are competitive. And that's actually one of the good case for RPA. It's mm -hmm. like we can automate the process and instead of someone doing it monthly, for example, we can automate the process to run weekly or even nightly, right? And to ensure that our pricing is better than the competitors. Right. And it's funny, this is one of the requests that, you know, we're, we're never surprised by this. It seems like everybody's always interested in, in when you talk about sales and marketing, this is probably one of the most commonly asked activities getting out of the gate on RPA is the screen scrape. It's, it's kind of funny and comical. It's a good thing. Okay. Next. After sales and services. This is where you do the unattended bots and they interact with AI. 
you know, be like qualification of customers ahead of the call, setting up the rep so they can answer a call with much more information. Also set up the call to where a bot might be able to answer it and direct the call. Next one. And then we'll give you a success story where it's re retail and supply chain. Um, this is really a good example of a company in which primarily we, we came in and we built them a center of excellence. And it all started by uh, them just wanting to screen scrape and find out competitive values of products uh, from all their competitors. And it was discovered that, um, find, try to find a polite way to say this, it was discovered that their purchase order process had gotten out of control and that there were about 300 people doing the purchase order process. And there was a lack of controls and understanding of that process. And they were issuing, they had products that they had to, to have at all their distribution points and all their retail stores. And when those products went low at, at different levels, there was no uniform level. It was very subjective. They would write a purchase order and they would um, take a loan on the products that, the, that they tried to purchase or create and fulfill the shelves at all their locations. And what was going on was that people were sub submitting a PO for, let's say, um, apples at one location. And when it didn't get delivered or fulfilled, they issued another PO, then another, then another, then another, then another. And these POs, sometimes you had a dozen, you had 18, 20 POs that were of all different ages, anywhere from a day to a year to much longer. And the um, when we did this process and we cleaned this process up, that department was disbanded except for a small group of people that oversaw the process. Um, and the POs dropped phenomenally and that company realized a savings of $8 million in the first year as a result of cleaning up the purchase order process. And what also was able to be done on this, and this is, a, this is what comes up about vendor management. They had contracts with all of their vendors and suppliers that had SLAs. Um, the majority, the vast majority of those contracts were not in compliance. And they were able for the first time in their company history to go back to their vendors and suppliers and hold them accountable for the, um, the products that weren't being delivered. Uh, so it was really a great success for them. And then um, they're also able to cut down how much they had to take loans on, on products to get delivered to their location. And that financed the program um, and it's still going on today and they've scaled it throughout the entire organization. I think now they're moving into, um, they just passed machine learning and are going into AI uh, with the applications of RP at the same time. Okay. The next one, Bob? Any questions? I have a question uh, yes. about, uh, so um, after the post, post implementation in, in terms of maintaining the bot, uh, do you guys provide some kind of like a training to internal person to handle the ongoing issues or? Yes. Um, so, you... Yeah, it's, it's I kind of cool, cool you ask that question. Do you want to answer it, Fon, you want me to? Uh, let me start and you can Excellent. Uh, add. Uh, I mean, because the short answer is yes. Part of our approach is a lot of what we do is actually more education than anything. So if your company, for example, like you don't have RPA or intelligent automation initiative, we start with proof, right? They should like crawl, walk, and run. Mm -hmm. And along the way, our success, what we define success is basically like at the end of the day, when you can run the program on your own, then we've done our part. Because just being realistic in any businesses, professionals, contractors, consultants, there are additional costs, right? So throughout the engagement at the beginning, we may run the show in the middle of the journey, it should be a hybrid team. And that's what when you start training or building your team and we help the transitions. And at the end, it should be run by your team. Mm -hmm. And for the continuous improvement, we're available to provide support 
course, and we should be available on demand when you need to scale up. Because yeah. once your program is up and running, maybe everything goes into maintenance mode or support mode, while you may have one or two developers in-house, but six months down the road, you see a higher volume and you need to scale up for a few weeks, for example, and we can augment that. I see. And in terms of budgeting and the costing side of it, so post implementation, what kind of cost do the company should be aware of, like category of the cost and, and how roughly how much is it should be to maintain? Is that a kind of like a license kind of a thing, annual subscription? Yeah. So let, let's go back, hold that part of the question. Mm -hmm. We'll go back and you want to answer it right now, Farm, you want to uh, go back? No, no, go ahead. So one of the things I mean is that we are not interested in being at a client's location forever, okay? We are interested in building bots and delivering value and making you self-sufficient, okay? And you owning the program. So in other words, we really strive to teach people how to fish not to do the fishing for you ever and be a fixture in the company. Is that, you understand? Yes. Okay, we're not we're not interested in that, we're really not. There's, it's a big world, there's a lot going on. We wanna keep learning and having fun and, and delivering value. On the cost component, um, when I, I'd mentioned earlier in the call to everybody that we do like a capacity model, okay? You won't see this very often. Um, we're, we're not really software salesmen. Okay, we're not into selling you packages. What we're in and where our strength lies is we sell you what you can make operational and what you can evolve to. You see where I'm going? Yeah. So, you, you know, we may sell you two developer licenses and an unattended bot because you're going to do three automation candidates, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. and, and we measure how well you're learning in their training. Okay. And how, how you can start to, you know, like sponsor, crawl, walk, and run. We will sell you what you need and what you can grow into. We will not take and deliver you a package that you're not going to grow into. And we aren't going to sell you a package that will distract from the reason why you're automating. You're automating. You want to automate quality automation candidate. And you want to deliver value. You don't want to be sitting there learning how to, to you know, do a, a platform and all this other stuff and get confused. You want to understand and learn RPA and start to crawl, <clears throat> run like Bond said. And another aspect of our thing that we do that is, is to that point is that we also teach you that return on investment is how well you learn to utilize the bots, right? How you schedule them so they can complement each other and you get full utilization out of them. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. All right. So it's all about teaching you how to manage your bots, build your bots, run your bots, right? And then expand your program in a quality manner and you owning it, okay? And if you need us, we come in and do a surgical strike on something and you move on, okay? Does that answer your question? Yeah, I was just kind of curious, is there any further cost after the implementation, but sounds like there's none like uh, a, a license or kind of a thing, right? Uh, yeah. No, because there is, that's not a black and white answer, right? Because right. we can have two different companies in the same industry, but even those companies, they have their own culture, they have their own process, and those variables impact the requirements as far as what they need. That's part of the reason why we slice and dice our approaches the way we do is to facilitate those gaps. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I have one, yeah. Yeah, I have one, yeah, one question. Uh, in your experience, what's the typical number of uh, bots uh, deployed in a manufacturing company? Is it 10 bots, 20 bots? Because we cover different use case, right? Yeah. So do we, do we need a one bot per use case or multiple bot no, per use case? No, no, that's not quite <laughs> Is that a trick question, Ganesh? Is that a trick question? <laughs> so no, how, many, how many bots are needed typically for a company, manufacturing company? Bond, do you want to go ahead and answer or you want me to? No, go ahead. All right, so number one is, uh, let's let's break, let's break the, uh, there's certain myths out there, right, that we always like to break and they're kind of fun to break. And people will sell on this. You need one bot for one process. No, no. It's all about, you know how you schedule jobs, right? You schedule your jobs 
and you get your IT jobs, you schedule them so they all run right, and, and you get production. You, and, and you schedule bots the same way, all right? There's a science to it in which you maximize the value of the bots. And the goal really is not to buy a lot of bots, buy what you need, all right, to fit your use cases like Bob was saying, right? And start out small, manage that, become operationally inclined on that, right? And move forward. We see people start, I'll give you the norm, right? Manufacturing, usually three to five unattended bots okay. and probably about six developer licenses, right? But we always have to warn people, you know, it's kind of like you get excited about something, right? Your your eyes get bigger than your stomach. It's like, what can you, because remember what I said earlier, Ganesh, you get start getting into the process. You may think you know the process and all of a sudden you're like, holy cow, I really don't know this process. Mm -hmm. And then you got these licenses sitting over here. They're not used, right? So start small and grow into it. And then what we do, Ganesh, too, is that we often, um, more often than not with clients when we're growing into it, is that they need licenses. We um, will tie those licenses to the original start date, end date of the first one. So they're partial, right? So they can you can choose where they all will end on an X date. Rather than we see it, we've come in and cleaned up after some other people where they keep selling licenses at a year run, right? Right. And then you got like six licenses, six different end dates. But no, no, keep it simple. Again, focus on the pipeline. <laughs> Does that answer your question? Yeah. So basically, what I understand, you may not, you don't need multiple bots. So same bot can do multiple uh, business uh, functions. Yes. And, uh, what happens to load balancing? Do you need to have a, because each one has a capacity, right? So then that's why you, you will balance. Excellent question. Excellent question. I can explain that. So I was this, excited uh, about that one. This, no, this, this, that one is a fun question. So it depends because the, the rule of thumb basically, right? Like we, we mentioned before, 17 hours a day. Part of the reason is it's not being realistic unless you have a process that runs for X number of days. I mean, between the scheduling overhead, because it's in order for the bot to hit the 24 hour capacity, it needs to run before midnight last night till past midnight today, nonstop, right? But being realistic, there's scheduling overhead. And then also, if you have a small job, let's say a five minute job, but it's conflicting because they need to run at eight in the morning, then you need two licenses because you need to have two robots run in parallel. Right. Mm -hmm. So as far as scalability goes, it depends. If there is no conflict, then we can see the capacity of the bot. Usually when we start seeing like 70%, 80% capacity, we add another one. Right. Or when we need to scale up. So there are multiple factors that we need to see and measure before we start adding number of bots. But it's not one bot per process, mm -hmm. but depending on the, 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 the needs, the schedules, and the volume. Thank you. Thank you. And then uh, please also, Ganesh, there's another thing, you know, we have the attended and unattended bots. When you get into unattended bots, those will have breaks in it where decisions are made. Like you may want to say, I want to review all this work, give it my stamp of approval, and then before it kicks off and goes out. So there's nuances like that that influence. Okay. okay? Thank and you. And there's a lot more into it. And also, like, if, if you're interested, we can always schedule, like, a follow-up and we can discuss it. And I can illustrate to you what the load balancing looks like. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Okay. Um, just maybe in between, we're at the top of the hour. Um, I know it was a really good discussion. Um, and we see some people already starting to drop. I mean, definitely, we can go a little bit longer if needed, if there are additional questions or so. I would recommend just to screenshot the um, presentation, what you can see here, just to have the contact information of Earl and Fan. And then the presentation itself will be made available on YouTube on the Fang uh, channel. Um, so you can review it afterwards as well in case you missed anything or, you know, if you write down the email address, you miss a, a letter in between or something like that. And you certainly always can reach out to me and I can provide you contact information as well um, to both of them. Thank you, everybody. It was a pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Fun. Take care, everybody. Right. Have a good one. Thank you. Bye now.